This is uh, week two, Revolt of the Planters. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about what, uh, if you want to call them, the Southern aristocracy. Uh, I mean, the first thing to understand here about the Southern aristocracy, are they really an aristocracy like from the princely houses of Europe? No. No, they're not. But perhaps they're the closest thing we had at this point. Uh, so a southern aristocracy, landed gentry, slaves, social standing, uh, princely houses of Europe centuries ago with serfs, landed gentry, social standing. Uh, there, there, there are parallels here. And they are existing in an era by, the, by 1860 where it's undeniable at this point that, that politics, society, economy is changing. And what's helping to change that? Well, those liberal ideas unleashed by the French Revolution and the American Revolution. Ideas, again, of liberalism, democracy, socialism, secularism, republicanism, uh, nationalism, parliamentarianism. Uh, where people can sit in assembly or have representatives they vote for perform that function of representing their interests instead of having some uh, faceless monarch who doesn't care for them anyway issuing edicts from on high. Uh, that seems to be changing at this point. And yet you have some people south of the Mason-Dixon line who are gravitating to this idea of the landed gentry. This is an idea that's dying at this point. It's dying. However, this, th this idea of the landed gentry goes back even before the foundings of the country. The before the foundings of the country. And of course, the engine, the engine of this, if you want to use the term southern capitalism, or cottonism, or cotton capitalism, if you want to use that term here, uh, is the slave, the unpaid toiler, those people stuck in a lifelong purgatory of bondage. And interesting here, again, getting back, in, and I'm going to go into this more in depth uh, in January when I do that four talk set on slave because next year marks the 400th anniversary of the first slaves being brought here. 400 years ago, 1619, and that's a year before the pilgrims got here. Jamestown, right, 20 slaves, Dutch traders bringing, bringing the first 20 blacks here. And so we've been saddled with the ghost of this, not only the implementation, but now the ghost of this for 400 years. Boy, that's a long time. It's a long time. And so you see these unpaid toilers. Interestingly enough, uh, about 11 million, it's estimated 11, you're not, there's no way to be exact with this, but some 11 million blacks were taken from Africa and brought to the New World. Upwards of 650,000 were actually brought here. Most of them went to the Caribbean, Central, South America, so on and so forth. But still in all, and keep in mind here, as bad as slavery was here, uh, if you were a slave in the South, you were probably better off than going to Haiti. Uh, yeah, the sugar plantations. Uh, it, uh, the, the attrition rate for people down here uh, justifies descript it, just, it just defies description here. Uh, you know, it, it really does. But that's not to say that these people had it easy down south. They did not. Not to say that at all. But the fact of the matter is the climate was more conducive to some prospect of longevity. Interesting here, these, these, uh, the, the, the white man tried to subject the Indian to slavery. It didn't work out too well. Number one, these braves are on their home territory. That's a difference. And number two, many of these braves, you know, male, male red men, the red man, the, re, the male version of this, uh, I don't do such work, women do. And the problem, yeah, the, the, the problem here is when they were able to escape, 
the bondage of slavery, they're on their home turf. They can form guerrilla bands. And that's what happens. So some of these white traders, well, you know, some of them, when the British were settling here, would take them and then export them down to places like in the Caribbean. Now they're off. Now they're out of their own territory. And so that's another reason why the red man is not going to like the white man. But the black man was best for this, not the red man. But again, though, some red men were, fell into this bondage of slavery. And so this, interesting here, as this, as this takes off, because keep in mind here, things like, well, cotton is the poster child expression, tobacco in the Tidewater area, uh, sugar, rice. And this was conducive to this idea of slavery. And so you have these unpaid toilers. And then by the end of the American Revolution, and, and even before the uh, American Revolution, you're getting to the point where they're, you know, they're breeding here. So there's less need for importation. Of course, by 188, Congress outlaws the importation of slaves. But the fact of the matter is they're breeding them here. And so when you take a look at this underpinning of the plantation system, there's like about a million or so slaves at the beginning of the 19th century. There's almost 4 million in the South by 1860. Almost 4 million. That's interesting from the perspective that there was approximately 9 million people below the Mason-Dixon line. Almost 4 million were slaves or living and breathing property. And so there's just over 5 million whites. Doesn't leave you, you know, and up in the north, there's like 23 million people when the war starts. And so the, the south is outnumbered what? Two and a half to one? And so who has the choice of troops, numbers-wise? In, yeah, interesting where this goes. But this idea of the aristocracy gains momentum here. And interestingly enough, uh, the, the, the British, British bankers and businessmen took advantage of the, of the planters here. You know, they, they, would, they, they, they would be loaned money at certain interest rates. And then guess what happened when the bankers got them on the hook? Where'd the rates go? Uh, up. And so, interestingly enough, you know, the South would grow, these planters would grow these crops, but once, once they were picked and once they sold them, they not, they're not the ones that really make the big profits. Guess who make the big profits? Number one, the New England shipping interests, and once they're in Europe, uh, additional insurance charges, freight charges, duties, exporting what they're growing in the South onto the European continent, guess who's making that? The British shipping interests, you know, the, 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 the business interests. These, these plantation owners aren't making this. They're not making this at all. And so once that many, and Jefferson even complained about this, once these southern plantation owners were on the hook, but, you know, they're, they're trying to pay off these debts. And while maintaining that, that aristocratic lifestyle. That's a tough ticket. And so will that help push them to revolution? Yes, it will. But even again, as I mentioned last week, this, this difference between the Hamiltonian and the, Jeff and, the, and the Jeffersonian outlook on where the country ought to go. And again, Jefferson, a nation of farmers, the agrarian. The agrarian is the salt of the earth. And since the agrarian digs in that earth and owns that land, he is the best person to protect Republican government. Why? Because he has skin in the game because he owns the land. And again, John Adams, you know, for a functioning system of representative government, the wide ownership of land is required. He's no slave owner. Where is he? He's up in Massachusetts. But again, at people like Adams and, and even, and even uh, Alexander Hamilton, they understand the importance of land and the control of same. 
You know, too much land and too few hands breeds what? Revolution eventually. All you have to do is take a look at the United States. All you have to do, Russia is another one. China, Vietnam, Cuba. I mean, Castro was even given the land of the peasants for crying out loud. You, you see a trend here? Iraq was another place. Uh, you know, what, what, what the Brits did to those Iraqis is just absolutely horrible. Uh, in the 1920s and 30s, and finally they were thrown out in 58 with the 58 revolution. The French did the same thing in Vietnam, Southeast Asia. Uh, too much land and too few hands. And when there's too much land and too few hands, those who don't have the land can't dictate the agenda. Which I like to remind some young people today because many young people don't seem to want to own, not as many young people want to seem to own a house. And so when you don't own the land, and I think they're going to find out eventually years down the road, guess what? I made that point. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that building they want to, that structure they want to put up near the East Norwalk Railroad Station. They, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with East Norwalk, that whistle stop railroad station we have in East Norwalk where the old hat factory was, they want to put up a five, six-story structure with 189 rentals in it and a restaurant, swimming pool, so on and so forth. And so in the course of some of these planning and zoning meetings and, and, and associ neighborhood association meetings, I asked uh, one of these uh, architects, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you're going to put up 189 rentals, right? Yeah. And at one point it was over 220. And I said, so you're, how many of these people, you expect to rent all these? Yeah, we do. Well, how, has, a, has a study been done or projection made as to how many of these people are actually going to walk across the street to the railroad station? You know, commuters going to New York and back and forth, right? And I said about 15%. So I said, what you're telling me here is this isn't being built for the Whistle Stop Railroad Station. And I said, well, why can't you have a two or three story building conducive to East Norwalk? Bring in small business for people who live in the area. We like, to, we like that small neighborhood, that small town atmosphere. And I said, this is just the first bitter foretaste of a shot that's being fired at the homeowner in East Norwalk. In fact, at one of those meetings, this one guy said, gee whiz, I think it's great. I've got 189 new rentals. And I said, 189 new families. I said, yeah, one owner of the property. What the heck's the matter with you? We're taking it on the chin here. Well, it's the same thing here. Too much land and too few hands. Now, it's interesting what this leads to. You know, as you go into the, from the 18th to the 19th century, it's that landed gentry, the southern planter, who really controls the politics. Why does he control the politics? Because he controls the economic agenda. He's growing those crops that everyone will feed off of. Again, it's the cotton, the rice, the tobacco, uh, the sugar. And so you, ha you also have a plethora, many more small farmers. But the small farmers who vastly outnumber the plantation owners, they grow, they have hay, livestock, uh, 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 so hogs, so on and so forth, they're not open for export. Who's buying a lot of what they have? The plantation owner. And so the small farmer now is geared to what? Indirectly? Well, no, directly because of what the plantation owner is buying from the, from the small farmer. What the small farmer has to offer for sale. Again, hay, grain, cattle, hogs, so on and so forth, to feed the plantation. And so there aren't as many people who own slaves. Now, most, of the, most of the Southerners didn't own slaves. Most didn't. And then again, you have that fledgling business class. Uh, bankers, millers, a few factory owners by comparison to the North who benefit from what? The export of these products. And then, of course, you have the bottom end of this social hierarchy, the slave who has no control over his fate, his or her fate. Interesting, as the 19th century, as the 19th century proceeds toward 1860-61, there is this race in this country as we open up 
the territories. Remember the Louisiana Territory. And as we move on here, you know, we grab Florida, which is obviously going to be a slave state. As you move on through the southwest, states like appear, well, Georgia already had, but states like Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi appear, Louisiana. And interesting here with cotton. Now, cotton was grown in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, but as the Southwest moves, on, moves out, you know, they, they, they keep adding states here, slavery is going to expand. And as it expands, interestingly enough, you really need some 200 frostless days to really grow cotton, to have it a successful crop. Well, don't they get frost in North Carolina? Yeah, they do. Can't you have chilly days in North Carolina? It's actually a pretty good, it's actually a nice state. I mean, you still get your mountains, your trees, so on and so forth. But, so cotton will really be uh, grown, at, still in North Carolina, but more so South Carolina, Georgia, places like Alabama, Arkansas, and it's in, in, into Louisiana. Why? The days, la the warm days last longer. But however, what does that entail? Well, if you're opening up more plantations, what does that mean? You need more slaves, right? And so some of these older plantation owners, guess what they're doing? They're selling some of their slaves. They're renting some of their slaves. And interestingly enough, it's upwards from a couple of the sources I read, upwards of 100,000 slaves will be exported across these new states. And, what, how, and how do they do that? Quite simply, if you've got a family of slaves, a husband and wife who are slaves that have five, six, eight, nine kids, guess what's happening to some of their kids? They're being sold off, right, exactly. And it doesn't make any difference what they like or don't like. Those kids are going to be taken and sold off. That's how Harriet Tubman escaped. Um, she lost three of her three of her brothers and sisters to uh, sales of this nature, and uh, she escaped. Her story is fascinating. I'm going to go into that when I do the American Gulag, because that, that needs to be told. Her story is fantastic. Yes. Right. And so but you also see them getting into things like fertilizer. I, I, knew, I used to know a guy who... Remember we used to get a lot of the bluefish... I know bluefish coming into Norwalk, and they used to chase the bunker fish. And then the tide would go out, and this guy, Sonny, would go out with uh, hip waiter boots and two five-gallon buckets. Not all the bunker fish made it when the tide went out. They were on the mud flats. He would go out and get two five-gallon bucket loads of dead bunker fish, take them home, dig up his garden, and plant them. Fresh fertilizer. Going back to the fertilizer idea. That's what he used to do every year. And Sonny used to get nice big tomatoes and so on and so forth. Why was fresh fertilizer? He said, what do I want to go buy fertilizer for? I'll just put my hip waders on and grab the dead bunker. It was a good idea. You know, it's natural fertilizer. But yeah, they were experimenting with, with uh, you know, like things with regards to fertilizer to replenish the ground. Because as, you know, as these states come into the union, well, you know, new states like Maine, they're not going to be able to get up there. How about Oregon, California? No, they're not going to be slave states. They're going to be free states. But then again, why would the, why, why would the slaveholders want to get into these states? They can't really grow their crops here. How about even New Mexico? You're going to grow cotton in the sand? No, you're not. And so they're eventually going to be restricted as to how much territory they're going to have. But then again, at the same time, this aristocracy is thinking if their north is going to stop us from having like places like Kansas as a slave state, then it's eventually going to happen where they're eventually going to stop us from growing cotton in South Carolina. Now, keep in mind, too, uh, the north was making a lot of money off the slave trade. Interestingly enough, a study was done by a southern historian. They said by the time, and again, Again, some of these southern plantation owners are going to look upon the Yankee bank and business interests just as they looked upon the British bank and business interests. It was calculated by a southern historian that by the time the cotton was grown and picked, okay, 
it was costing them, by the time they grown and grew and picked it, and by the time they, they sold it, was costing them like $2.80. They were making $2.85. $2.85. And they figured out, huh, $2.85 a bale, all right? And at the same time, by the time the northern interest got done shipping it up to the north, shipping it out, like out of Baltimore, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, they were making like 15 bucks a bale. Who's making the money here on, on, southern, on southern cotton? The north. <laughs> That's one reason, another one of those big reasons why some of these southern, uh, some of the some of their aristocracy, were angry. They weren't getting the proper share, and they're the ones doing the work. Interestingly enough, here, interestingly enough, uh, with regards to these slaves, and when you get back to the earlier part of the 19th century, what it costs for a slave, a robust field hand. A robust slave sometimes costs these plantation, uh, these plantation owners five or six hundred dollars a pop. That's a lot of money back then for that for that property. And yet by 1859 or so, was costing about one thousand eight hundred dollars for a virile or robust slave. This is prime property here this living and breathing, breathing property, all goes into, again, this aristocracy, uh, you know, controlling uh, living and breathing people as property. It's fascinating. And then again, when, you know, when we get into, I'll go this more next week, this idea of states' rights. We are the real defenders of the U.S. Constitution. We are the defenders of states' rights. And again, the right-wing aspect of the Southern Revolution, slavery is not a democratic principle. That's a democratic principle? How is that a democratic principle? It's not. So again, they are. They are defending undemocratic principles here with their so-called agenda of states' rights. I understand the idea of individual states. And they went overboard with that. Because event eventually when you have 11 southern states and you want to knit this for war, how come you have 11 states supposedly bound together and when it comes to the railroads, they have 11 different gauges of tracking? How are you going to move all this stuff? How are you going to move this stuff from point A to point B? Yeah, well, individualism, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the same thing when uh, the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union. Now, uh, only 5% of the Russian roads were paved in 1941. So what do you think happened to these roads after snows and ice melted or you have a heavy rainstorm? Well, how about the trains, right? Gee, that sounds like a good idea. Well, the, the Soviet gauge of tracking was different than the European gauge. And so the Nazis had to rip up all the rails and replace the rails. And then in 1943, when the war reversed, what do you think the Soviets are doing as they're moving west now? Yeah, they're laying new tracking as they go along here. Yeah, that's a problem. That's a problem. And so, you know, now you're going to have to re-gauge the states so that they're, what, one gauge so you can move stuff. You can move, you can use the railroads. <laughs> and anyway, that's the idea of this ardent individualism. And that breeds something else here, this southern aristocracy. This idea of the plantation owner. You know, they create their, their own economic fiefdoms. They do. In, a, in, a, in various areas of the South, economic fiefdoms. This actually leads to ruralism as opposed to urbanization. You know, the largest city in the South by the time of the, 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 revolu by the, time of the, the Civil War is New Orleans with just over 168,000 people. It was the only city in the top 10 in this country. The only city. Most cities didn't have as many people. Even the capital. Richmond? I think it was about 25 or 28,000 people here at most. It will increase as the war goes on, but I'm going to get into that more next week when I go into how it changes the, the, the southern economy. 
but it but it really it really accentuates this idea of the landed gentry really accentuates provincialism because you have the plantation and the small farmers around it feeding that plantation with their hogs, their cattle, their hay, and their grain. And so you create this economic fiefdom here with the plantation owner. And if he controls the economic agenda, really, what else does he control? The political agenda. And so does this disseminate power? Is, is, is this power really colluded here? Not really. Not really. This is almost like when you have, back in medieval time, a king, but then the nobility owns their what? Their fiefdoms. They have their knights, they, 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 they have with their family, the knights, but then again what? The serfs, who they control. It's the same thing. And they have acres and acres and acres of land. This is the same sort of thing. And so this idea of a confederacy, a united confederacy, in the beginning, not to the extent that maybe the North is united. Interestingly enough, this idea of this provincialism also breeds a degree of illiteracy in the South. And I'm not talking about the black, I'm talking about the white. This provincialism, this idea of being tied to the land. Upwards of 20% of whites in the, in the South were illiterate. We're illiterate. And yet, some Europeans, when they came to um, New England, I'm talking like in the 1850s, when they were reviewing this growing industrialization going on in the United States, uh, there were some in Europe watching this, and they came here. They were surprised how literate some of the average workers were in the North people working in textile mills, wagon factories, so on and so forth. They were taken aback at how literate many of them were. The illiteracy rate up in the north, maybe 5%, as opposed to what was going on in the south. Of course, understand something here, you know, with, with shipping and receiving going on here, imports, exports, doesn't that open your country up to what's going on outside your borders. Yes. And also you had that influx in the 1840s, 1850s, you know, with the uprisings in Europe, people coming in from Europe, Irish, Germans, and where are many of them going? Many of them were going north, but then west. Here is a chance for me to own Land, something I can't do in Europe. Keep in mind, 1850s, Marx has already wrote the Communist Manifesto. And so these people want land. So it's interesting here how up in the north, it seems generally people were more intelligent. Why? Education system is better. More people are literate. Interesting today when you see that half the American public is on an eighth grade reading level or less. And I'm not kidding. Yes. Well, keep in mind here, sometimes some of the small farmers, as this goes on here, I mean, the, 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 future, the future of the plantation owners is not only reproduction, where, where the, the plantation owner has, fam has, a, has children and then they get land, but some of these smaller farmers are able to make enough money to buy additional acreage, and guess what they're going to do? they are going to become, they're going to have enough money to buy a few slaves and then get started. And they're going to join that class. But keep in mind, some of the, and, and, I, and, I, and I bring this out here because uh, I found this interesting here, uh, the upcountry and low country plantation owners. Interesting here, the ideal of the planter, the country gentleman. Uh, let's see, where do I have it here? First, first page here? Yeah, the upcountry planter differed from his low country counterpart, both in the crop he raised and in the life he lived. The great old Carolinas were mostly low country names. St. Philip's and St. Michael's churchyards in Charleston held the remains of most of the distinguished old families, 
wealth, position, distinctive style of life were transmitted from one generation to another. Well, that sounds like royalty in Europe. That's what it sounds like. And of, of the low country gentry to the next, and served as a buffer against the onslaughts of life. The upcountry planter, however, achieved his wealth and prominence only recently as the spread of short staple cotton displaced the yeoman farmer with a rugged, aggressive, and frequently uncouth breed of frontiersmen who reaped rapid and great wealth from the soil. Well, as this thing known as cotton and slavery is beginning to expand across not only the South but Southwest, guess what? You have to fill that void. More plantations, somebody's got to own those plantations, so sometimes it's some of these small farmers. And so are they really, this new breed of plantation owner, are they really, by comparison to the old-style family, are they really that aristocracy that once really began to populate the South? Not really. They're a cruder form of individual. And I'm sure some of the old breed didn't quite get along with the new breed. You know. Um, and so, yeah, but, ha but keep in mind, this is, an expanding, this is an expanding institution. Slavery and the plantation. Because why? That is what's the basis of the southern economy. And again, this breeds this provincialism, this ruralism, and also, the highly individual nature of the Southerner. Highly individual nature. Because why? These plantation, these fiefdoms, they don't live in the city. They don't have to be concerned with what, uh, what a council is thinking of them or what the mayor is thinking of them. They have their own fiefdoms here. They control it. They control it. They are virtually a law unto themselves. The same sort of thing isn't quite happening up in the north. Why? Because as cities begin to expand here, because of factories, you're getting what? The wage earner, the factory worker, is what you're getting. And so people are living in closer proximity. There's more of a knit society here. Even down south here, as this, as this snowballs, and this, and, this, and, the, and this aura of fear, the aura of fear, I went into this with my, uh, with my class on communism, and how Stalin was able to get what he wanted because he created this aura of fear in the Soviet Union in the late 20s through the 30s. He uses various incidents outside of Russia where countries crack down on the communists. And he, convinced, and he convinces the people that, you see what's happening here? The capitalists are encroaching. And they're going to destroy Lenin's revolution unless we come together. Hence, that's his program of, that's how he starts this program of forced industrialization of the Soviet Union. He creates this aura of fear. Well, the same sort of thing is happening down here. If they're going to stop us from having slaves in Kansas, they're eventually going to stop us from having our slave economy down in Georgia, down in South Carolina, Louisiana. So we need to band together. That aura of fear, and this is where you begin to get these firebrands, like in the 1850s like Edward Lowndes like Edward Lowndes Yancey, uh, Robert Barnwell Rhett. He's interesting. Robert Barnwell Rhett. Gee whiz, Rhett Butler here? Doesn't that sound like a real Southern name, right? His, his real name was Smith. He took that name on. He, he was, though, he was an editor of the, of the, of the, of the I think it was the Charlotte, Mer Charlotte? Or the Charleston Mercury. It was a paper. Vehemently anti-North vehemently anti-North, pro, ver, uh, ardently pro-South. Edmund Lounge Yancey is interesting. He, is, he was ardently, an older gentleman, ardently pro-Southerner, hated the North. In fact, he, is, he will be accorded the first lanyard pole on the first cannon that fires at Fort Sumter. He did this at other battles, you know. What was he doing on a battlefield? The guy, the, the, guy, the guy should have been collecting Social Security. Of course, it didn't exist then. He was too old. They let him pull lan lanyards on these cannons. And you know what's going to happen to him? He was so ardently pro-Confederacy that when the South surrendered, 
he wrapped himself up in a Confederate flag and shot himself. Yep. Yeah. And so th this, you know, e e e even though people like Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, I mean, people like Calhoun, yes, were they notoriously pro-South? Yes, but Calhoun was pro-Union. He was pro-Union. And so, but after they're gone, these people, again, like Robert Barnwell, you know, Rhett, Edward Lowndes Yancey, Edmund Ruffin was another one. He, he's, uh, he was interesting from the perspective, again, Edward, actually, Edward, no, it was Edmund Ruffin who pulled the first lanyard. Edward Lowndes Yancey was really one of those ardent speakers for the South. Edmund Ruffin is the one who, who pulled the lanyards and then shot himself. But, I mean, these guys were ardently, ardently pro-Southern, Southern hated the North. And they're pushing this fear agenda. And Edward Lowndes Yancey used to go all over the South giving speeches. We have to come together. We got to make sure the North doesn't encroach and take over. I mean, this, this, is, this is this creating this aura of fear. And, but at the same time, this idea of the Southern aristocracy will be maintained. I, I, it's, it's, it's absolutely fascinating here. It truly is. It's absolutely fascinating how, how, th how this really gets out of control here at, this, at one point here. 1860. Now, th this, is, this is fascinating here, too. 1860. There were only 385,000 slaveholders out of a population, well, I said nine, 9 million, but take almost the 4 million slaves out, let's say 5 million, that's a distinct minority. That's a distinct minority. Just under 4 million were the property in question slaves. The greatest concentration of slaveholders were from Georgia to Louisiana, some one-third. Now, interesting here, taking ownership of 20 slaves as the minimum for membership into the planter class a study of the census data reveals that the great majority of southern slaveholders could not be called planters. In 1860, 88% of them had fewer than 20 slaves. 72% had fewer than 10. And nearly 50% fewer than 5. Most of those in the planter class owned 20 and 50 slaves. Approximately 10,000 owned 50 or more, and only 3,000, get this, this is a distinct minority, only 3,000 owned more than 100 slaves, yet the majority of slaves lived on plantations. And so you see this concentration of wealth and power with the slave, the engine of the southern economy, in what? Few hands. That's what you're seeing here. Interesting. Yes. Right. Distinct minority, but that did exist. I mean, keep in mind when you get to that issue of free blacks, uh, some of them were picked up and re dumped back into the slave situation. Right. Became slaves. You know, and, and what I found interesting after the war, after the Civil War, a number of m black men went west. Didn't want to stay in the South at all. Can't blame them. And I don't think this is really depicted too well in many American Westerns, that a lot of the cowboys were black. Yeah, that's not really depicted too well. Um, in fact, I've read... I'm not going to say these sources are bona fide, but some were 15, 18% of the cowboys were black. Well, John Pershing, remember him? General Pershing. Why was he called Black Jack? Because he was in command at one point of a black cavalry unit. Black Jack Pershing later became general of Amer the American Expeditionary Force in France. George, George Clemenceau <laughs> George Clemenso asked him, President of France then, uh, what is it with this blackjack? And Pershing is trying to explain this to him, and he's, you know, okay. Wasn't overly impressed with this. Uh, but uh, real, I guess he really didn't get the concept. But blackjack, 
Oh, yeah, he was in command of a black cavalry unit. So there were a number of black men in the U.S. cavalry out west. Interesting, they're fighting Indians to a certain extent. Indians became an oppressed people. Interesting how that is. Buffalo soldiers, right. Some of them even went to the Philippines, uh, in the, uh, Cuba rather, fighting against the Spanish. Uh, so it's interesting here, the plight of the black man and women, but the black man in this respect after the war. Some going west, cattle drives. Some of these black cowboys were on cattle drives. Interesting, but again, your American Western really does not depict this. Glaring omission there, of course, I'm sure there's a reason for that. Uh, but it's fascinating here, it truly is. But again, you're, you're seeing here this idea of the Southern aristocracy, and again, it's really not emblematic of what your Constitution and Bill of Rights stands for. Consent of the governed, the freedom of the individual, how is that emblematic with the Southern aristocracy here? And then again, they want to hold on to this because they have primacy of the land. That's what they have, and they can virtually control the politics because why? They control a lot of the economy. But then again, at the same time, going back to 1840, 1850, eight, the 1860s, the world is changing. And they're really out of their depth at this point. A nation of farmers is dying at this point. And maybe they don't see it. Maybe they don't care to see it. But they are not going to last. They are going to become a flash in the pan because of the Industrial Revolution, the evolution of capitalism, technology. It's changing the globe. People are moving away from the land. Heck, even Russia abolished serfdom in 1861. Of course, that didn't eliminate the plight of the peasant. That's not the point. The point here is even they understand that, yeah, serfdom isn't working out too well, so let's ditch it. And that's exactly what they're going to do. D yes? In Russia? Huh. You, know, you know what they did to, uh, as a sop? to the landed gentry here, because the boyers are really what keeps the czar in power. In fact, it's the, the boyers are really one of those major, major reasons why Russia, it took Russia long to begin industrialization. And the, to placate them, uh, especially like with uh, government-owned communal lands, these peasants, or, or these peasants could buy the land with a 50-year mortgage. And so the boyers are going to overcharge them for the feed, the tools, and the animals, and then underpay them for the crops they're going. You're now stuck in indentured servitude. And is that going to help bring Lenin to power later on? Yeah, it sure will. It sure will. Because Lenin wasn't stupid. He understood this quite well. And so it's interesting where, from 1861, where that goes by 1917. And so this idea of the landed gentry, it's dying here, even in 18, the 1830s, 1840s. It takes a while to roll over and die, but it's going to die. It's going to die. Interesting here. Anybody have any questions or comments here? Yeah. Well, yeah, the, that three-fifths compromise, you're quite right, that the South could count actually 60% of their slaves in the end toward representation in Congress. And at the same time, when you had that Missouri Compromise, Missouri will come in as a slave state. However, the North is going to get Maine because that state was coming in. But at the same time, even though, even though the, the, the states, what are going to be states like Oregon, California, places like this, that are not conducive to, to what Southern agrarianism, uh, there were there were uh, fights, political fights here, between admitting them as slave states or, or, or free states. And again, New Mexico. New Mexico, a lot of New Mexico is what? Mountainous or desert. And so, uh, you know, Texas, you can grow things like cotton. You can do that. But not out in, not out in uh, maybe Arizona or New Mexico. So those states can come in as Confederate states, maybe, 
if they, if they put, but what are they going to be able to grow there? And so the, economically speaking, what's important? Having, just having a number of states or having an economically viable system. But then again, with industrialization, even that's going to change. And so, yes, there were various fights in Congress about, about the idea of admitting slave or free states, and the North understood this. And so we need to limit anything above Missouri cannot come in as a slave state because of what? The Three-Fifths Compromise. It's still in the Constitution. Well, yeah, it's irrelevant. But then again, going back to what uh, Thomas Jefferson stated in that letter to Samuel Kershaw in 1816, uh, we ought to have a constitutional convention every, every 19, 20 years or every generation to acclimate the document to the current generation. Again, Thomas Jefferson, uh, the, the present belongs to the living, not the dead. That would seem to make sense. And so, sure, you're going to have amendments applied to the Constitution periodically, but have we ever had that convention that Jefferson said we need to have to acclimate the document? And so, if you had a convention, would they have taken the Three-Fifths Compromise out? Especially after the war, when the South begins to industrialize. Yeah, what do you need that for? Uh, because the South begins to urbanize. Uh, perhaps. And I'll give you another one here, and that opens up a discussion. That's not slavery, but opens up a discussion. You know, when you had the Second Amendment, the well-regulated militia, the right of the citizen to bear arms shall not be infringed, that was based off a time you had the citizen-soldier concept, the militia. That was bolstered by the 1792 Militia Act, where the governors controlled the militias, and all these guys bought their own guns, and, and the states appointed the officers, the army didn't. Well, in 1903, when they came out with the National Guard Act, you're beginning the governors lose control of the militias. And guess who buys the guns for these militiamen now, who are no longer militiamen, they're National Guardsmen? The Army does. In other words, Washington does. And now they can be sent overseas after this. That's not what the governors want. And so, but was the Second Amendment changed to reflect the demise of the 1792 Militia Act replaced by the 1903 National Guard Act? No. And so the National Guard you see today, that's not the well-regulated militia as originally intended. That's a bona fide reserve of the United States Army. So now who is the well-regulated militia? The common, everyday, ever-loving American gun owner? Again, does Jefferson come to mind here? Yes. And so, does that go back to the three-fifths compromise? Sure, that could, have been, that, could have been, that could have been even struck from the Constitution, maybe. But it's not intention to do that. So it still sits there. You can still read the Constitution and find that. That's old. It doesn't, it's not relevant. Yes. Right. Well, yeah, the st yeah, you elect your state legislator, and then your state legislator elects your two senators. That was, that was part of that discussion after the mid-1890s when America industrialized and with its growing financial power. And there were people like John D. Rockefeller who was trying to get together with Carnegie and the Morgans and them uh, in arranging the economy uh, for their benefit. He's saying that uh, you, we will never make the money we want to make in a free market. So let's put the pressure on the state legislators to appoint those senators who will pass those laws, rules, regulations, resolutions to, so the economy can be benefited, beneficial to us. In other words, he wants a corporate state. And so by 1913, you will see, based in part off some of that progressive movement, keep in mind, there were many socialists in this country. Eugene Debs running for president, remember that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, and you see, yes, in 1913, the amendment will be added to the Constitution that now the common everyday voter can now vote for his six year, his or her, well, his, and women don't get the right to vote until seven years later. People can vote for their six year senator. But that's the same year they passed the Federal Reserve Act. So who controls the money? Private bankers. 
And so here we are back again. They threw you something, but took something back. So, so it, but it, does it get people maybe more involved in voting, uh, voting in people they want in their government? Yeah. Yeah. So, but then again, a weakness of our Constitution is, yes, you had the electors in your Constitution. It's in your Constitution. The states have to have electors. How the, state, how the electors are picked, it's up to the states. But what we didn't put in is that maybe how we have our politicians, maybe that should have been put into the Constitution, how you are able to become an office holder. Maybe there should have been a blueprint attached to the Constitution to do that. Because since that didn't happen, guess who filled that void? Democrats and Republicans. Wonderful. And so maybe that's another weakness in our Constitution. Nice to have the electors, but then again, how do we pick our politicians here? Should there be a blueprint or a prescription to do that? Uh, just throw that out there. And so again, getting back to the three-fifths compromise, yeah, there were northern politicians who did not want an overburdening amount of slave states because that would have given, right, based off... How can, how can you have, un, you know, if, think about it. Living and breathing property, and they're not con they can't vote, they're not considered political, they're not considered human beings. How can they be counted in the tally <laughs> for these southern representatives? In fact, when, um, in fact, when they had, uh, there was a conference in Panama, and there, all the, these, these republics put together this, uh, down, down Central and South America, uh, they were having a, they were going to put, try to put together a supranational organization for Central and South American states. And the United States voted, was vote, the United States Congress was voting to send two representatives to this Congress, and the South, South filibustered. They didn't want the U.S. government to send two representatives. Why? Because in Central and South America, they outlawed slavery. And so the South filibustered. The North will finally punch this through, and they will send two representatives, one of them who dies en route. One gets there. I think his name was Robert Sargent. And by the time he gets there, this Congress is over. And guess who else made out politically and economically here? The British. They sent observers, and they inked some trade deals with these new republics. Interesting, the politics there. But the South filibustered, why? Because these countries had outlawed slavery. Same thing with Haiti. When the Haitians threw the French out, the first real, black, the first real slave, successful slave revolution, oh, the South didn't want, didn't want that publicized at all. Might give the blacks here uh, unwanted notions. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Interesting here, because the slave was the underpinning of their economy. And let's understand this, an underpinning of a lot of the American economy. Because the North benefited from this too, with the products they were processing or shipping out. It's fascinating here how important the slave was to the American economy. That's really worth a whole talk in itself. But you, you, you get the general gist here, how important it was. It had to be important. Plantations? Could the plantations exist as they did without the slave? No. No. And I'm going to get into that deeper when I do that American gulag in January. I'll go into the, econo the act actual economics of slavery. Uh, it's fascinating. It truly is. It's truly fascinating. You know, uh, having an economic system based off the bondage of your fellow man. But then again, this has been going on for centuries anyway. Now, slavery came in a variety of guises. So even slave soldiers, so on and so forth. Going back to the Seljuk Turks and the Abbasid Caliphate. So fascinating how slaves, uh, you know, there's the different slavery appearing in different guises. Anyway, when, we come, when I come back next week, I am going to do uh, getting into the war itself and this idea of states' rights and the idea of 
us, the South, being the practitioners of states' rights and the champion of our Constitution. And why that changes and how this idea of Southernism is going to die here. And I'm eventually going to get into the Southern military industrial complex. Get a load of that one. It did exist. It didn't when the war started. It will when the war really gets started here. And how this idea of the South against states' rights and defenders of the Constitution really becomes a strong, central, controlled state. Richmond. What happened to civil rights here? What, 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 ha what happened to a functioning system of representative government? Doesn't exist. War will kill it. It will change the whole complexion of the South. And they are a mirror. The South is a mirror of what's going to happen in Europe f uh, 50 years later. And you can say it's a mirror of what happened to this country since. Interesting what you see here. Fascinating. History doing this. Yes. That was starting well into the 19th century. As America is pushing itself beyond its borders, Hawaii was important as a rest area. It was, a, it was you know, where the, of course, the the pineapple sugar interest is interesting here but a lot of your whalers put in here uh, ships American ships leaving the states going to Asia or coming back a rest refit uh, you know but uh, we're eventually going to take this over in fact we're going to grab Midway Island in 1867 not not just not just the Hawaiian or the sandwich islands as they used to call them and that leads you to the Philippines was another one you know, we're going to grab the Phil we're going to grab Hawaii, but then we're going to grab the Philippines because that's a jump off point to China. Uh, it's all part of the same program here. America pushing into the Pacific, which is why the British didn't want us to build a canal in Central America too soon. And in fact, in 1850, we and the British will sign something known as the Clayton Bulwer Treaty by which Neither side, the British or the Americans, could build a canal in Central, this is 1850, could not build a canal in Central or South America without the cooperation or acquiescence of the other party. The British knew we were going to grow here, but they didn't want us growing too fast. And in 1901, with the hay pants fought Treaty, that will supersede the clayton Bulwer Treaty and guess what Teddy Roosevelt's going to do in Panama? Panama Canal. But in 1850, the British stopped us, and so you're going to have to take that long trip around South America to get to the Pacific. But the British didn't want us growing too fast. But American ships were already in the Pacific. You know this thing called globalism? <laughs> yeah, you're seeing it then. And so we are, in fact, by the Spanish-American War, um, was it Senator Danridge, I think it is? Uh, prior to this, Spanish-American War stated that, uh, the, you know, we're, we're beginning to flex our muscles here. And he said, uh, because we wanted the resources in the Philippines, that was part of this, but it's a jump-off point to China, and he states, in 1896, I'll have to double check it tonight, 1896, 1897, that the future wars will be fought for resources by contending powers. We have, yeah we are, yep. And so he was right in the long run here. We haven't even struck oil, we haven't even really had oil yet to speak of, so, but that's coming. As, as a determinant here. You have oil already, but it's not a determinant yet, but that's coming. So he was right about that. And so you see, but again, you'll, you'll, we'll see, you'll see the last, the last uh, in two weeks when we finish this, how the South was now getting away from that agrarianism and moving to the Hamiltonian agenda of industrialization. I'm sure some of you folks remember maybe as kids, remember the hat factories and textile factories we had here? Where did they go? Well, they went south, and then from there, where'd they go? 
Yeah, China, so on and so forth, right. And now some of them are leaving China. Where are they going? Vietnam, places like this, Bangladesh, so on and so forth. There's a place you want to work. So, yeah, you can. You can. So it's interesting how these move, uh, you know, at, at different periods here. Anyway, anybody else have any questions or, or comments? Oh, as you can see on, on these handouts, I've had, there's, there's, there's an abbreviated bibliography, too. And some of those books are pretty good, by the way. Um, some of those books are pretty good, which is, when I consulted those volumes, but also if you find something about this you like and you want to do additional research yourself, there's a few volumes in which to do that. Uh, noticed on the first page of this, <laughs> uh, there's a historian, he used to be a Southern historian, U.B. Uh, Phillips. The central theme of Southern history is that the South shall be and remain a white man's country. Wow, that's 1934. Can that argument be made today, perhaps? Depends on which side of the argument you're on. Haven't more northerners moved down there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, I have a, some people in my family that moved down to North and South Carolina. And my daughter, my daughter lived down in Florida for a while until she came back here. And you know, my wife and I were talking. Well, where are we going? Where are we going to go? You know, when we retire here, I know you, Vermont, so on and so forth. I'd rather go north, but. Um, my wife has, is allergic to the cold. Yeah. Yeah, you know. She, she says, well, if we go north, you know, I, I'm allergic to the cold. I said, what am I going to do? I said, grow long fingernails. You're in for a lot of scratching. Well, my daughter says, why don't you go, why, how about Florida? Florida? I said, I'm not going to God's waiting room. <laughs> not going there. No thanks. Too flat, too hot, no mountains, storm. Now there's storms in Florida. I'm not going to a swamp. So, I'm not going there. Anyway. Beg your pardon? Yeah, the red, it's the red tide. Yeah. And so, uh, nah, I don't, know, I don't know. That's right. I was kidding my wife the other day because I, I have this... Um, current events class, and she asked me last week, how did the uh, current events class go? I said, oh, went fine. I said, well, we what we discussed about uh, women's issues and uh, the, 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 the uh, assassination of that Khashoggi, Khashoggi, or that southern, uh, that southern Saudi uh, journalist, yeah, discussed that. And I said, we even discussed Italy. She says, what happened in Italy? I said, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. She says, Leaning Tower? What happened with the Leaning Tower of Pisa? That you haven't heard about? I said, Italian-American, you haven't heard about? Don't you keep up on, on, on uh, no, I don't know. I said, yeah, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. She goes, oh, my God, don't tell me it fell. I said, no, it's not that. It didn't fall. I said, it got sold. She goes, it got sold? Sold. I said, yeah, it was bought. And she says, What? I said, yeah, the Italians are all up in arms here. I said, they're, they're, they're really miffed here. I said, they're complaining. I said, they got bought by a foreign company. I said, that, you know, it's Italian landmark, bought, you know, almost like what happened here when uh, Rockefeller Center got sold to the Japanese. Remember that? How some people were up on their high horse, right? Yeah. Uh, highly nationalistic. I said, well, the same thing happened in Italy. She says, well, who bought, who bought it? I said, Hilton Hotels. She says, Hilton Hotels? I said, yeah. And I said, they even changed the name. She goes, changed the name? I said, yeah, they now call it the Tilton Hilton. <laughs> and my wife says, you're a, I, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> the Tilton. Yeah, you know, yeah, it has to, there has to be a little levity here somewhere along the line. Yeah, the Tilton Hilton. Yeah, okay. Uh, Norwalk Community College uh, for the lifetime learners. Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing the current events now. So. So anyway, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, so when you go to Italy, <laughs> stay at. Uh, yeah, you got a place to stay, the Tilton Hilton. <laughs> Beg your pardon? Yes, yes. 
Have yourselves a good evening. Take care.